Hello and welcome to another NandLand.com YouTube tutorial. In this video, I'm going to talk about uh, the second most important component inside of an FPGA, and that is the flip-flop. We need some epic music here. Flip-flop. Boom. Very important component inside of an FPGA. In the previous video, I talked about lookup tables, or LUTs. Uh, I told you how LUTs can be used to program any uh, Boolean algebra equation you can think of, given three inputs, or four inputs, or five inputs. And flip-flops are the second most important part of an FPGA. And those are used in combination with LUTs to do everything inside of an FPGA, for the most part. Um, there are other things inside of an FPGA, but flip-flops and LUTs are by far the most important parts. Without them, you would not have an FPGA. So, let's get into what is a flip-flop. A flip-flop can sometimes also be called a register, but I'm going to draw what a flip-flop looks like now. A flip-flop looks like this. like there should be some epic music playing. This is very exciting stuff. So a flip-flop has two inputs and one output. This right here is a D flip-flop. Um, that's what it is called. There are other flip-flops. There's a JK flip-flop, for example. Uh, T flip-flops, I think, are still things. Um, honestly, I don't remember what the other ones are because they're not important. If you're in an, if you're in an electronics class uh, at college, university, you might be learning about other types of flip-flops. I will tell you that uh, in the real world, I'd be surprised if you ever use any of them other than a D flip-flop. D flip-flops are what are inside FPGAs. They are used by far the most frequently. Uh, there are other inputs to flip-flops too, by the way, but. For this video, I'm just going to focus on these three inputs here. There's a reset input, for example, but let's ignore that. Um, let's just talk about these three. So, D. D is your, da is your data input. Uh, data. Data in. Arrow daily. Clock. Q. Out. There you go. So, it doesn't seem all that complicated, there's just three things. Hmm, what is a clock? I have not introduced what a clock is. So, I suppose now is as good of a time as any to introduce the concept of a clock. Clocks. Clocks inside of FPGAs. I'm not talking about a wristwatch, I'm not talking about an analog clock. I am talking about a clock that looks like this. A clock is a square wave that it runs throughout your FPGA at some specified frequency. Frequency means um, cycles per second, number of cycles per second. So for example, if you had a one mega hertz clock, that means mega is 10 to the sixth power. So 1 times 10 to the 6th hertz. If you're unfamiliar with the concept of hertz, uh, it's cycles per second. So cycles, in this case, a cycle in a clock is referring to um, the entire duration, the entire action of a clock. So it starts, we can look at one cycle starting here, going here, going here, to the back down here. So this is one clock cycle here. So here's one clock cycle, here's the second clock cycle, here's the third clock cycle, here is the fourth clock cycle. Um, cycles per second, one megahertz, meaning one million cycles per second. So um, one megahertz clock is, is a clock that your FPGA might have. It might have 10 megahertz clock, 100 megahertz clock, uh, FPGAs generally run around the 100 megahertz uh, clock frequency. They can certainly run slower than that. 
Uh, when you start getting faster than that, uh, you start to push the envelope of what the technology is capable of. But clock is the, is the fundamental part of what makes an FPGA tick. And the reason for that is that it's the input to all your flip-flops. All flip-flops have a clock input. And the clock is the thing that drives the FPGA. It is the most important thing to understand it, and it's a little bit abstract to think about because they only exist inside FPGAs. They don't exist. A clock concept in this way does not exist inside of a processor. A, a clock inside of a processor keeps things running, but it doesn't go to every single flip-flop like it does in an FPGA. Every flip-flop has the clock. So let's talk about it a little bit more. Since it is so important, I kind of think of a clock as... A, this giant gear that, that rotates. It almost kind of makes sense because it looks like teeth on a gear. But in order for your flip-flops to actually churn and do stuff, they need to have this clock running through them and turning the whole FPGA. The FPGA moves as if it's sets of gears. So you can think of it that way. Maybe that helps. Um, the, the clock for your FPGA is the main gear driving all of these little tiny flip-flops of which there are thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of flip-flops inside one FPGA. So now, it's, it's an abstract concept, and it's going to take some time to understand how a clock works, but I'm going to show you some waveforms that, at first glance, won't make a lot of sense, but the more you get familiar with the concept, the more it will make sense. It is something that's going to take some practice on your end, so I recommend looking at some more examples and, um, and just, just working through it, eventually it becomes second nature. But I'm going to show you the waveforms for a, a D flip-flop. So this is what it looks like. I'm going to erase it. So what happens, previously I have shown in other videos, what happens to your output given sets of inputs? And they were pretty obvious. With a LUT, you had OR gates, you had AND gates uh, that made up that were inside of the lookup table, and it was pretty obvious when your input was a one, your output was this. When your when your input was a zero, your output was this. And, and you could look at the circuit, you could draw the truth table kind of off the top of your head, and see what was happening. Now, a flip flop only has two inputs. However, one of them is this clock, and the clock is a little bit different. I'll show you why. So. Let's say you have, I'm going to draw, uh, what I'm going to draw now is I'm going to draw some waveforms. Truth tables don't really work when it comes to flip-flops. And the reason for that is that flip-flops are triggered on edges. The edge of a clock. So uh, I drew a clock up here before, I'll redraw it. 90... Five, nine, maybe even 99% of the time, the positive edge is what you are going to care about as an FPGA designer, or the rising edge. That means when the clock goes from a 0 to a 1. Where does that happen? It happens here, here, and here. And if I draw the one, right, there you go. So in this particular waveform here, you can see three, I'm sorry, four rising edges. Rising edges. Let's focus on rising edges. Rising edges tell your flip-flop, look at what your data is doing and make your output do that thing. Rising edges are what tell your flip-flop to move, to do another cycle, to do a turn. It's a little, if you imagine your flip-flop as a gear, they say chunk, you know, they chunk your gear forward one cycle. So let's, I'm going to draw a waveform now. So here's your data, data, or your D input. Um, let's say it does something like this, and this is, this is time. So time, this is, this is uh, old, previous time, this is kind of now time, so this is what happens over a period of, who knows, a nanosecond, a millisecond, a second, who knows, some amount of time. And here is your clock. And your clock does something that looks like 
So the question is, given this waveform for your data, D input, and your clock input, what does your output look like? Now again, if it was a truth table, you just look at it. But flip-flops require you to look at things in time. So this is again time. I'm going to do a positive edge triggered flip-flop or a rising edge triggered flip-flop. Again, rising edge of the clock. So what you need to think to yourself is, what does the output Q do on the rising edges? D, a D flip-flop, will the output will follow the input, but only on the rising edges. So what that means is the output will start low, and then the rising edge of the clock comes along right here, rising edge from 0 to 1. So the flip-flop will say, okay, I see a rising edge of my clock. What does the data look like at that rising edge? So if you were to draw some dotted line here, and say at this particular moment in time, let's sample the data. Let's take a look at it and sample it. And latch, register that. This is why they're called registers, because it, it looks at the data at that time and it registers it to the output. So flip-flop and register, it's another word for the same component inside of an FPGA. So rising edge comes along, I'm going to register that input to this output. And then I'm going to stay low. And I'm going to stay low until I see not a falling edge here, but another rising edge, which occurs right here. So I can guarantee that for this amount of time, Q is going to be low again. It's low still. Even though D has gone high, at this time, here is the moment in time where D goes high. Q doesn't know about it. It doesn't see it. It only can see that happen on the rising edge, which doesn't occur until out here. So Q is, continues to be low, continues to be a zero, until this rising edge comes along here, and it says it samples D again, and it samples a 1. So Q will then become a 1. So there you go. This is what your output looks like if you were to look at it over time. You'll notice it looks like your input, but it's shifted in time a little bit, and it's aligned to your clock edges. So your output of your flip-flops will always be aligned to the rising edge of your clock. Again, it's an abstract concept when you first think about it, but we'll do another example here, and further down the line it's going to become more obvious as to how this works. This is very fundamental to understand, so let's do another example. Let's see. Let's do something clock is like this, and your data does low, high, low. What does Q do? Nope. Think about it, take a guess, I'll let you think about it a little bit. Q is going to start low, sees a rising edge here, and it sees a rising edge here. And those are the only points where it's going to sample your data. So it's going to say, what is the data at this point? It's a zero, so I'm going to be a zero. And I don't even care that the data goes high right there. Q, the output, doesn't see it. So it stays zero. And then it sees, oh, I see another, output, another rising edge here. What is my D input doing? It's still low. So I'm just going to stay low. So Q never sees the fact that there is a pulse on your data line because it doesn't align with any clock edge. So Q never goes high. It stays low the whole time. Now, what happens if we do something like this? Okay, rising edge of the clock is where we care about what happens to Q. There are your rising edges. So here are the possibility, possible spots where Q can change. It's going to start low. It's going to get to a rising edge. It's going to sample D. There we go. 
It's going to stay high, even though D goes low here. Q doesn't see it. Here's a rising edge here. Q goes back low again. Oop, here's another rising edge. Q goes back high again. And then it stays high like that. So, there you go. So hopefully this has become a little bit more clear as to what happens with a D flip-flop. Now that's just one flip-flop. What happens if you have two, two flip-flops? I'll draw the circuit out for what, what that might look like first. So, here's your clock, here's D, here's Q, here's your clock, here's D, here's Q, and here's your input, let's call this uh, in. I'm going to wire the output of flip-flop 1 to the input of flip-flop 2. And now my output here is out. We're going to call this, uh, let's see, let's call this Q1, call this Q2. And this could be, uh, I guess, D1. And D2 can be the same, D2 and Q1 are the same thing. And here's your clock, so... So this is kind of something interesting. spells clock. Both of your flip-flops share a clock input. That's kind of interesting. So if they share a clock input, then that means that they are tied together. Um, so I'm, I'm going to draw the, the waveform of what happens here with, with two flip-flops cascaded back to back. Uh, let's see, I'll draw it up here maybe. So we have, give, it this, give us some room, we have D1, we're going to have, let's call it Q1, we're going to have Q2, and we're going to have our clock. So I'm going to, I'm just going to draw uh, an example waveform of what would happen here. And again, it's going to be a little abstract to think about it first, but it becomes more natural. So let's let's just get it. let's get started here. So, clock, clock, clock. Three possible rising edges here, here, here. So let's say our data starts low and it goes high here, and then it stays high for the rest of the time. What happens to Q1 and Q2? I will show you. Q1 and Q2 are both always looking at the data line, or at their, at their particular input line. So Q1 is looking at D1, and it is low. And it gets to this, we can do Q1 independently of Q2, because the Q1 only depends on D1 and your clock. So let's do the whole Q1 first. So, Q1 says, okay, uh, here's a rising edge. I'm going to sample my data. I'm going to be low. And I'm going to stay low until the next rising edge. Here's your next rising edge. So, I'll stop drawing these. So now another rising edge comes along. Q1 says, what's my data? And it says, ah, it's a one. I'm going to go high. And here's another rising edge here. Samples the data again. Stays high. Q1 stays high. But it is a little bit goes high a little bit later than your data one goes high. Good. Now, what does Q2 do, the second flip-flop in the cascaded chain? Q2 looks at Q1. Q1 and D2 are the same thing. So, we'll draw that there. We wired the output of Q1 to the input of Q2. So, Q2 is looking at Q1 slash D2, whatever you want to call it. So, Q2 looks at the input here. So here's your, this is the input to the second flip-flop. And it says, okay, the input is low, so I'm going to stay low. And then it looks at the input again. What do you think is going to happen here? Kind of hard to tell, isn't it? Is that edge a zero or... Is that a one? 
Well, now, when you look at these signals, you will actually see these signals when you are building your FPGAs if you use a simulation tool. They, these are called waveforms. These actually, you will see these waveforms appear. And this happens all the time. And you need to think about what this actually means. If I am sampling this edge, this data right here, with this flip-flop here, what does Q2 do? And I will tell you, it's not intuitive, but it doesn't see this happen. Uh, what, it, what it actually sees is it sees this as a zero. It does not see it as a one. Okay, take it for granted for now. I will explain why. But it sees this, it says, okay, I see this, this went high, but I see a zero on the line. So I'm gonna stay low. It samples it again. Now, D2, Q1 is high. It's not, in the, it's not transitioning like it was here. So here is where Q2 goes high. This is very important and a little bit confusing. Q2 is delayed by one clock cycle from Q1. I'm going to repeat that. Q2 is delayed by one clock cycle from Q1. So whatever happens on the output of Q1 will happen to the output of Q2 one clock cycle later, which is exactly what you see right here. On, let's call this clock cycle 1, clock cycle 2, clock cycle 3. On clock cycle 2, Q1 went high, on clock cycle 3, Q2 went high. So it is delayed by one clock cycle. Now, I'll say this, if you don't understand this, it's okay, but the reason why it's delayed by one clock cycle is because it actually takes a little bit of time for this to occur. So in the simulation world on the, on the whiteboard here, I'm drawing this as it instantly goes high on this clock edge, Q, Q1 instantly goes high, but in reality, there is a little bit of time that it takes for this edge to go up on a physical circuit. And that is actually due to propagation delay. Not important right now, but I will talk about propagation delay in a future video. For now, just realize that when you see an edge like this on a waveform, you are sampling the current value. You're not sampling, any, you're not sampling the, the next value, you're sampling the current value, which is what it was before that transition, okay? There you go. So, again, if you're confused right now, it's okay. Maybe rewatch the video, think about it a little bit more. I'm going to show more examples in the future of waveforms and clock edges and things like that. It's a bit of an abstract concept, but it is critically important. The reason why it's critically important is that Flip-flops keep state inside of an FPGA. They are the things that you use to know what happened previously. So you have an input and it changes. What was the input before it changed? Uh, that is done with flip-flops. So they are critically important to an FPGA's designer. It's, a little, it's an abstract concept, it takes some time to get used to, but flip-flops and lookup tables are the two most important parts of an FPGA. We're going to get into exactly how these are created with your VHDL and your Verilog code in future videos, but this is the introduction to how they work. So, I look forward to continuing our FPGA development in the future. Thanks for watching this tutorial for Nandland.com. I am Russell.